In their final attempt of the day, Pedro and Radek targeted the LAN interface of the TP-Link AC1750 smart Wi-Fi router. They used a total of three different bugs, starting with the command injection vulnerability, to get their code executed on the target. They earned themselves another $5,000 and half a Master of Pwned point. That brings their total winnings for the first day of their first Pwned own ever to $30,000. Not a bad first day. Hey guys, this is Pedro from the Flashback team. In this video, we're going to show you how we found and exploited a vulnerability in a TP-Link router. We used this vulnerability to win $5,000 in the Pwn2Own 2019 competition. In this competition, using techniques similar to what we describe in this video, we achieved a total of $55,000 in prizes. I'm going to show you how we approach a target how we use some hardware modifications to gain initial root access, and how we found the vulnerability. Pedro will demonstrate how we exploit it. So I'm Radek, your flashback team, let's get started. At Pwn2On 2019, we attacked a TP-Link Archer C7, home user router. It's a very popular device with over 60,000 positive reviews on Amazon in Germany. As the vendor advertises, it's the best router for most people. You can literally take it out of the box and without any configuration plug it into your network and it would just work, which actually made it more vulnerable. It can also work as a media server, but we didn't look into that. But we did look into a mesh configuration that it supports and oh boy, that was a successful one. With this type of targets, we would usually start with searching for debug interfaces such as UART. If we are lucky, it would be left open. And that was the case here. There is an obvious UART on the lower right hand side. As we could download the firmware from the vendor side, we didn't have to search for the storage chip and try to dump the firmware. If you try to find UART, you would usually search for an interface with four pins. The pin number one is often marked with a dot triangle or similar. Then you can connect your device into it. The transceiver on your device would connect to the RX pin on the target. This is where your input will go be going. The TX on the target will go to your RX. That's where the target's output is. Ground will go to ground. Simple. Fourth pin you can ignore. But now the question is, how do you identify each of the pins? Right, I would start off with the multimeter and the ground pin. Simply switch a multimeter into a continuity mode, find a grounded element on the router and move a probe one by one. When you hear the beep sound, that is your ground. Now you are ready to find TX and RX. You could use a logic analyzer for that or continue with a multimeter. With the router power on, test the remaining pins. A pin with a constant 3.3 volts is most likely a power pin. You don't need it now. A pin with 0 volts is probably a RX, as it would expect data from you. A pin that has a floating voltage is a TX, as that's the data that the router is sending. At this stage, you could simply connect your device to UART. However, with this particular device, we realized that the RX line was not connected to the pin. In other words, the router would not react to the input. If we were at home, we could use a nice articulated arms to connect to that RX pad. But actually, when we are hacking this router, we are traveling in a remote locations in Laos. We could only use gear that we had with us and, well, we didn't have much with us. So I said, kurva, Pedro, we have to do it the Eastern European style. We took a paper clip, cut it, and connected the line with a pin. Wow, that was a great idea. It worked like a charm. Now we could connect to UART while being remote. Now simply use baud rate 115-200 and there we go. A beautiful bootlog with all the information about the router. Memory mapping, U-boot, network interfaces and so on. That is a great start. And the most important, a root access. This way, we can begin hunting for wounds and we don't have to worry about the debugging possibilities. 
As we have root access, we can do a quick recon. We set the architecture as MIPS. Partitions are mounted as read-write. It will be crucial for us later on to deliver the exploit. All processes are running as root. <laughs> Great. Let's see which ports are open. Okay, the netstat is not there. Let's quickly download the MIPS compiled busybox with all basic commands and we'll be able to use netstat. Okay, and there it is, our TDP server running on 20002 UDP port. We decided to go after this binary after we quickly checked which ports are reachable for us. We also did want to look into the web server, as TDP server binary looked much more interesting and also was a better pick from the pwn to -on strategy point of view. With Pedro, we have a bunch of automated scripts for full hunting. We used one that helps us to flag a potentially vulnerable parts of the functions. That way, we are able to quickly find a vulnerable system function call. So finding the vuln was easy, but don't be fooled. It was a serious reversing effort involved in order to understand how to deliver the payload to the target. And with this, I'm off to Pedro, who will explain that part. This is Pedro. I'm going to pick up where Radek left off and show you the vulnerability that we found while auditing system calls. Here we have a system call that executes a system command variable directly. This variable is first memset and then snprintf with the Lua command that includes a max string that comes from another variable. This looks like a vulnerable pattern, so let's look at it in a bit more detail. Here we have again the variable gets first memset, then snprintf with the slave mac as the argument and then finally execute it. So you can probably see already where the command injection is. But if we take it apart, we get the snprintf, we extract the Lua part, and then that mock looks like a place where we can probably control it and inject. If we can inject some shell method characters, we can escape the Lua command and achieve command injection. So now we go back to Ghidra and find where the slave mac comes from and if we can control it. We scroll up, find various instances, but now we're looking for the first use of it to see if we can control it. So the first use is a mem set, and then there's an interesting SN string copy. This comes from this red2 object. This red2 object appears to be parsed out of something that also appears to contain strings, as we see. So this by itself comes from another object, which is the data object. This again, it is part from a larger object, payload deck. This payload deck appears to be decrypted from the packet. This packet is an argument to the function. Looks pretty promising. Let's continue digging a bit. Here we have the packet argument. Then that gets accessed, then decrypted. Then finally, we parse it. We extract the data object. Then we extract the slave Mac part of it. We write it to our slave Mac variable. And then we have our vulnerable code pattern. Looks juicy. I think we can exploit it. Let's move on. Let's go to Ghidra and try to trace it back. This is an argument, so we go to the caller. We see the packet being passed. The green caller indicates this is another argument to the function. So we go up again the call stack to see where it comes from. Then again, we have packet, again in green. So it appears to indicate we need to go up once more the call stack to see where this comes from as it is an argument to the function, until finally it appears that we struck gold. Our packet is created here and looks like it comes from the network using the receive from function. Let's recap. Here's our top level function. This reads from a UDP socket, creates a packet. This packet gets parsed to DDPD packet parser, which calls one mesh main. 
which calls one mesh slave key offer, which is our vulnerable function. Then packet gets processed, slave Mac is extracted from it, and finally we land in our vulnerable code pattern. Looks good? Now let's own it. So let's look at that command injection again. Here we have our injection point. And let's say we want to echo your mom to a file called D. So if we just put that there, nothing will happen, right? It's just a normal command. So first we have to escape with an apostrophe, which will escape the one on the left hand side. Then we add the graves that cause our command to run in a subshell. And finally, we add another apostrophe, which will escape the one on the right hand side. So again, our command will run three subcommands. The first one, an invalid Lua. The second one, our command. And the third one, another invalid command we don't care. But our command will run successfully. So now let's run the command in a shell and see what happens. If we run it as is, you can see it's quite verbose. This is because we're running it on a local machine. We don't have the necessary Lua packages. So let's redirect to dev null to avoid all that crap so we can see what's happening. And actually, nothing happens, right? So let's clear the console and let's put your mom in there and see what happens. So we just put the echo your mom to D there and we run it. Nothing happens. D does not exist. Okay, this is expected. We're not injecting anything. So let's add an apostrophe to close that first one and see what happens. And the shell hangs. That's because it expects another apostrophe, right? So we have three, so it's expecting a four, so it just hangs, doesn't run anything. Before we do that, let's put our uh, graves there that run the command in the subshell, see if something happens. Uh, not yet, because remember, we haven't closed that final apostrophe. Then we add that, we run it. Apparently nothing happens, but these there, and there's your mom. So now let's have a look at the packet format to try to understand what's going on. Here is the TDPD packet for this daemon. It's up to OX400 bytes. We have a version, type, opcode, the length of the packet, some flags, something we don't know and don't care about, serial number, a checksum, and our encrypted payload. So what is this encrypted payload? So if you recall, in a vulnerable function, we access uh, something at packet plus OX10, which is our encrypted payload, and then we decrypt it using the AES function with what appears is a fixed key. So if you want to create our encrypted packet to send, we have to encrypt it using AES and the same key in the payload. But what is this payload really? So the payload, again, if you recall from the function, it is a JSON structure. Then we have our method, which you saw in the function, in our data, substrings. Inside the data, there are various substrings, IP, slave Mac, etc. And if you recall, our injection is in slave Mac, right? So this is where we put your mom. This is where we inject our commands. And this will be our payload that we will encrypt. So if you've been paying attention, and I hope you have, then you'll know that our maximum injection is only 17 characters, or OX11. So this doesn't give us a lot to play with. Just the command to echo your mom is 16 characters alone. And the reason for this is because escaping is four characters and we have to include that. This only leaves us 13 characters to work with, which is pretty much nothing. So what can we do with 13 characters really? So the router doesn't have bash, Python, netcat, or anything that's easy reverse shells. So if you run a Lua command, we get lots of characters. If we try to use OpenSSL, lots of characters. Try to use wget, 43 characters. Even a simplified version of it is 24 characters. So are we stuck? Well, we can invoke the injection multiple times. So why don't we write a file character by character and then run that file as a shell script? And our objective is to download and execute a reverse shell binary. So this is our command. It's 42 characters. Let's break it down character by character, writing to a file that's called A, and then we execute this file. Seems simple, right? So here it is again, character by character, there's a, a file in the router. And slowly, we build this file up until we have our final command, and then execute it as a shell script with SHA, a final injection. 
So here's the process again in full glory. We got our packet with our payload. We encrypt it, create valid packets, send several of them until we build the A file in the router. We execute that as a shell script. We get a wget call to our HTTP server, downloads the reverse shell, execute it, we get the reverse shell, and we're in the money, and we got root. And this is a theory. So by now, you must be pretty tired of hearing my voice. I'm going to pass over to Radek, who will show you the exploit running on a real device. Okay, Pedro, let's get that money. So here is our Metasploit module. You can already find it in the master branch of the project. Let's quickly configure it for the target. On the right side, you can see a console view of the router. And now you can see how the payload is delivered to the target in small chunks. On the console view, we can observe how each small packet is processed by the TDP server. It will take some time as we are sending one char at a time. Great, the session is open. That means our exploit executed correctly. And you can actually see the content of the n file that contains our injected command and the C file which is the reverse shell. Quick look at our privileges. Yep, we're root, money in the bank. If you want to read more details about this and other exploits from us, take a look at our GitHub repository. The links are in the description. Please make sure to leave comments on what you think is good or what, you, or what could be improved in this video. Feel free to subscribe to our channel, we're gonna push a lot of interesting content soon. Yeah, interesting content indeed, Radek. We're planning to release more videos, so our videos will be a bit different than this one. So if this one felt rushed, this is because we had a lot to cover and also we're doing some experimentation since it's our first video. But the idea is to make educational videos like this one. We will show you how we set up our environment, how we go about finding vulnerabilities, and how we exploit them. So the next few videos will go into more detail, into more depth, and we'll have many more videos to cover what we want. So with that said, please leave us a comment, let us know what you think of this video, and thank you very much for watching.